Hi, I'm Leah Edelbaum, Fund Finance Partner at Kedwalader. This is Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. Today I'm joined by a very exciting guest, Adam Zotkow, head of the Alternative Markets Group at Goldman Sachs, is joining me today. Adam, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you very much for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about your group and a little bit about your career? Sure. Um, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but I, uh, I graduated from the University of Michigan, recent national champions, so we're very excited about that. Um, early on in my career, uh, I followed a non-traditional path. I was a banker for a year and a half, and it was during the dot-com era, and so obviously at the ripe old age of 22, I felt like I was capable of running a tech company, so started, uh, started a distance learning software company. Raised uh, two rounds of capital, had offices in New York and Boston, and ultimately um, it didn't work out the way I'd hoped. Uh, and so uh, really in 20, uh, 2001, I um, started applying to business schools and ended up going to Wharton to get my MBA. And then from there, had a cup of coffee at Lehman Brothers in equity derivatives and then moved to Goldman and been at Goldman for 18 years now. Even within Goldman, I would say I've had sort of a non-traditional path. Uh, I was always in the sort of structured product world, so whether it was credit or mortgages, I sort of bounced between both, um, was a structure in my early days there, and then during GFC, I thought I had one of the coolest jobs in the firm, if not streetwide, which was I got to partner with both our banking franchise and our salespeople and sort of circled the globe looking to provide restructuring solutions to banks going through the distress. Um, from there, I built out a solutions business and credit, and then ultimately in 2014, uh, I took over Structured Credit Salesforce, which was my first foray into really being a dedicated salesperson um, and managing a, a business there. And then we merged that with mortgages a few years later. I took over the combined business. And the best lesson I got really in 2017 into 2020 when I was managing that business was we pivoted from just traditional intermediation and new issue, still emphasizing those businesses, but we really started to also focus on loan trading and then financing. And so in those years, we made a couple of phenomenal hires and, and were able to grow our, both our balance sheet and our reputation in terms of the secured lending markets, doing more in consumer and commercial real estate um, and, and resi finance. And so that kind of led me to the COVID period where I got more involved in what we were doing on, the, you know, we had sort of a nascent fund finance uh, team that had no real franchise behind it. It was more opportunistic lending. Um, and so... Through a lot of that distress, they asked me to get involved, and it sort of led to this aha moment where I felt like we were missing a big opportunity in terms of partnering with all its clients and really build, building our lending businesses uh, in that domain. And so that's where AMG effectively was born from. So I heard a rumor oh, no. <laughs> that you wrote the business plan for what became AMG during COVID. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, we, I wrote a business plan you know, during that time period. You know, not thinking that, you know, we'd have an entirely separate platform, but really seeing an opportunity. As I think the growth of the business has been a function of a ton of people's contributions and support and sponsorship of what we've done. Um, but yeah, like, you know, having had the experience of you know, running mortgage and structured product sales and seeing how much of an opportunity there was in terms of the financing businesses there definitely led me to understand and believe that there was an opportunity that we weren't fully capturing on the fund finance side. You know, it's also interesting and probably even you know, equally as relevant was that during COVID, whatever existing facilities we had in place, and it wasn't a huge business for us at that time, obviously there was a, f a lot of distress going on and it really needed a client dimension and it hadn't really been run as a franchise to date. And so it was a confluence of well, this is a huge market opportunity. We haven't really built a franchise around that business to date. It is core to the firm strategy. All of those things came together. And the most important thing is, you know, getting people to buy into that. It was scary for me. I, I was, I think I was, you know, probably at the time managing a 25, 30 person sales force to be sort of employee number one of AMG and go out on my own. Um, but very quickly people got on board and, and joined and you know, I, I definitely don't want to leave the impression it was, you know, my personal success. It was, it's been the success of, of really everyone involved. Um, and, you know, the leadership of the firm did a great job sponsoring it and really creating a culture of entrepreneurialism that enables you to go take those kinds of chances. And ultimately, you know, this success was born from, you know, again, uh, just a, an, ar an army of people that have been, uh, I call them seed investors in what we accomplished. Let's talk a little bit about the Alternative Markets Group. Mm -hmm. I know your team, and you have a really unique setup and set of skills on that team. How yep. did that come to be? You know, it's interesting. You know, 
specifically within markets, you know, you tend to have traders and salespeople and quants. Um, the folks who sit on our team really have elements of all three. They're really great with clients. They uh, are really great structures. So they have that sort of technical quantitative capability. And so, and they have really a risk mentality. And so finding that job description is really hard. Um, but what we've been able to put together is a bunch of folks who really came at it from different perspectives, but have always sort of lived in, I will call it the gray areas of Goldman. Um, you know, they, they sort of had these like solutions oriented jobs and we sort of brought all those skills together. You know, when we were envisioning what the business would be, you know, going back to my days running the Salesforce, you know, we had a super technical sales team, but they're sitting on the public side. It's very hard to deal in private markets with a public side Salesforce. Bankers, we have a best-in-class banking franchise, world-class advisors, amazing sponsor relationships, and they're a great partner for us in terms of what we do. But going out and obviously sourcing or originating financing is not their day-to-day -day job. And so the idea was to create a team that brought all of those skill sets to bear, that worked in tandem with our sales force, that worked in tandem with our banking franchise. And that was not easy, right? Because you're bringing a lot of parts of the firm together, and the population of people who fit that job description is pretty narrow. And so to me, one of the bigger successes was getting that together, but really getting the firm to buy into what we were doing. In the early days, you know, it was a, we went through our growing pains, but now we've really matured to the point where we've become a core business. And, you know, I, I would say, obviously, we have a great team, but the team really extends well beyond AMG to other parts of the firm that have contributed massively to our success. And I think that will only continue to grow. And I think people understand the, the value of if we're successful, that will probably provide an ancillary benefit to them and their businesses. And so we really work in a really dynamic way. And I've always felt like with Goldman, that's kind of the secret sauce, which is we really work well across divisions, across businesses, and operate as a team to get the best answer for our clients. In 2021, the bank pivoted its approach to fund finance. Can you tell us a little bit about what that pivot was and how it came to be? Yeah, well, I think it was a broader pivot. I mean, we, um, you know, a few years prior, the firm did a great job about being ultra transparent with the street in terms of like what the core new strategies were going to be with, you know, David Solomon and John Waldron's leadership. I mean, one of the core pillars of that was really leaning in more on the lending side. You know, we didn't look like any other bank, you know, in terms of our markets business. Our revenues were 85, 90% based on trading and 10% financing. And we didn't look like any other bank that had a little bit more of a balance to it. So the idea was, can we grow more robust, durable revenues, partner with our clients and be capital efficient in terms of our lending businesses? We always had a great prime brokerage franchise that's continued to grow and that's been sort of a crown jewel business for us. But we wanted to pair that with more growth on the, what we call the FIC financing side. So fixed income lending. And so that's taken on more of that secure lending dimension, which some of the businesses I referred to earlier, whether it's resi, commercial real estate, or consumer. But this fund finance piece was sort of the emerging part where we felt like it was white space, both within our firm and streetwide. You start to see things like PE Nav start to develop. Um, we had had a couple of facilities in place on the credit lending side, so partnering with you know, more middle market credit funds. And then the subscription line business, didn't even exist within markets at the time. It sat within the private bank. We built a nice business over there, but it was very different in terms of the clients they catered to and in terms of its overall connection with the larger fund finance efforts. And so that was sort of the, the, the early stages of the growth that we saw. And that pivot in 2021 was really bringing those businesses together, putting a franchise in front of it, making sure that we were allocating balance sheet to the most important clients of the firm. We call it 1GS, sort of bring all of our resources to bear for these you know, massive cross-divisional clients, and then really capitalizing, and, and, you know, on a, capitalizing on the growth that we were seeing in alts and making sure that we had a place at the table to participate in that portion of the market. And I think it's, you know, it's worked out beautifully. And, and it seems to certainly has. You've also mentioned that Goldman provides end-to-end -end solutions for sure. fund clients. What does that mean? I think it's being relevant at every stage of a fund's life. And so whether it's subscription line at fund inception or providing an asset line over the life of the fund or being, you know, providing a hybrid facility as they're moving into a continuation fund, whatever the client's needs are, we need to be able to respond with best in class solutions. And so, you know, we, we really view ourselves as lifelong partners of these clients. We're not trying to optimize and maximize 
every single transaction. We're trying to build a very scalable model where we are there, we are there reliable and consistent throughout every stage of the fund's evolution. We just returned from Miami where we were at the FFA conference down there, which is, you know, this was the 13th annual global symposium. And the greatest thing about the conference mm -hmm. is the fact that it brings all members of the industry together. Yep. And we can talk about the most exciting or most pressing issues facing the industry. And managing capital is, you know, front of mind for banks for right sure. now. And as a result, CRT, which is something that U.S. banks are really um, using as an important tool yep. was, was a big topic. And Goldman plays a huge role in that space. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about Goldman's role in CRT transactions? Sure. Well, first of all, that was my third time at the conference. How many times have you been down there? I want to say it was my ninth or tenth. Okay. So I'm sure you, you have a much broader perspective than I do. But even in just the three years, the amount of growth that we've seen in the conference has been pretty amazing. And I think it's at least my understanding is it's evolved from like what used to be really a subscription line conference to really more of a mainstream, you know, everything from PNAV to ABLs to CRT. Um, so CRT sits within, uh, the effort sits within AMG. I, I often get the question, well, why does that product exist within your universe? If you think about it, right, a lot of times it's the risk transfer element of it can be done in derivative form. And when you're looking at the underlying portfolios, it's actually very similar to the analysis you would do if you were providing just regular way financing. And so um, we've got a, a pretty interesting uh, group of skill sets that we've put together, folks who really understand the regulatory environment. Um, you know, we work in tandem with our banking franchise who has best in class uh, FIG relationships. And, you know, our goal is to be able to give people options, right? To be able to provide a versatile suite of solutions, whether it's, you know, a credit link note transaction or intermediating a derivative uh, uh, trade. And so, Ultimately, what we're trying to do is understand the assets, understand the client's need, help them become more capital efficient. And the added benefit is, you know, we think about AMG, we don't really just think of ourselves as a balance sheet provider. We think of ourselves as sort of a part of the private markets ecosystem. And so what that means as it relates to CRT is if we're looking to offload the risk or intermediate the risk, we often know who to go to on the other side of the trade. And so the benefit of doing that is hopefully providing you know, really attractive risk or a bespoke investment opportunity to our best clients that will help ultimately um, strengthen the relationship between the two firms. You know, and, and speaking of opportunities, the 2023 regional banking crisis had a major impact on the fund finance industry, but there are a number of market players that found opportunity there yeah. and, and Goldman was among them. And you know, Goldman was the successful bidder in the FDIC auction, mm -hmm. coming out with two of the four portfolios of loans from the signature sure. book. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and the opportunities yeah. you saw there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, in the early days of, of AMG and what we were doing on the fund finance side, I had to go in and, and ultimately do a couple of things. Number one, um, ask for an opportunity, right? This is a mature, relatively mature market on the, on the alt side. And people had established long-term relationships in terms of lenders. And I think most people didn't think of Goldman as committed to this part of the market. And so for us, it was going in and number one, asking for an opportunity, establishing trust, making life easy in terms of the back end, whether it's asset approvals or getting the facilities in place quickly, make that user experience best in class. Um, but even... Today, oftentimes, we'll sit with clients and they say, are you in it for the long haul? Like, are you guys committed to this part of the, the market? And so, you know, we saw the signature opportunity as, as you know, really multidimensional. Number one, you know, we obviously like the risk. Um, and we were, we put a lot of time and effort into analyzing what was in the portfolio. We got comfortable with it. Um, we kind of knew we weren't going to get it some incredible discount. It wasn't this trade for us. What it was, was an opportunity to accelerate the growth of our platform very quickly and send a signal to the market that we're here for the long run. Um, and so, you know, I felt like we achieved that, would have liked to have won all, all four pools. We did bid on all four. Um, but, you know, we came away with, with half and we were really happy about it. And I think that the most important thing in the aftermath has been the establishment of onboarding those clients onto our platform and then continuing to grow those relationships on the follow. And with that acquisition, you have become one of the largest lenders in the fund finance space, both yep. combining that, those portfolios with your existing book of loans. 
Where, what are your plans for the future? To do more, um, to grow more. You know, I, I made reference earlier, and the firm is really committed to its lending businesses. Um, and so within that universe, uh, we're probably the fastest growing right now. And I think that that will continue. A lot of it's a byproduct of what our clients need, right? And, and you know, just whether you look at, you know, industry research or some of our own internal GS research, I think we could debate what the ultimate numbers are, but I think people are pretty confident that Alt is going to continue to grow, right? It's, um, it's a big part of, of the future investing environment. It's under-indexed as part of retail portfolios. It's 20% of institutional. It's 1% of retail. You know, there's new products coming online on a daily basis that our clients are, are developing. The fundraising environment, while it's meeting its level of challenges of late, is still got a pretty good momentum by any historical context. And so, um, you know, we really see that, that this is going to be an opportunity to build a long-term partnership with some of the most important clients of the firm while being in a business that's very attractive to us and then hopefully continuing to, um, to evolve as the market needs change. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of demand for financing. And the question will be, like, will banks be able to grow at that same pace without visibility into what the regulatory environment is going to bring? And so we're going to have to see what, what, um, what transpires there. But in terms of the, you know, near and intermediate term, we're absolutely committed to this market and I think we'll grow substantially. You've talked about growth of alts. Mm -hmm. How do you see banks and their ability to continue to partner with funds as they grow? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question because, you know, you look at some of the biggest players in the space and what they're projecting in terms of their growth, right? You know, you have the Blackstones of the world saying they're going to go from $320 billion to a $1 trillion over the next 10 years, just in credit assets. You have Apollo saying something similar in terms of their growth prospects, again, largely geared towards credit. So just credit alone, the question is, can banks keep pace, right? If you're going to see trillions of dollars of growth, and let's imagine that, I don't know, 25, 30% of that portion of that, oh, that portion of the market is levered, right? That's going to require at least 250, 300 billion of balance sheet. And so when you sort of extrapolate or do sort of a bottoms up analysis, the, the answer is you're going to have to have non-banks come into this portion of the market and find ways to partner uh, with the overall alts community to be able to, to fulfill a lot of these leverage needs. And so Part of the role that we take on with an AMG is, again, not to just be a pure balance sheet provider. A lot of what we do within our business is merchandise risk. So if we're making commitments of size, we may look to syndicate the loan. We may look to build a securitization vehicle for it. We may look to get a rating on it and market it into insurance companies. We may look to the 4A2 markets as a way to sort of uh, to, to offload risk and, again, do it in tandem with, with our, our, our clients. And so, you know, we really view us as view ourselves as a, as a center of an ecosystem more so than just a pure financing business. And that will enable us to scale our growth over time with those clients and hopefully meet their needs as the, the market reaches reach its full potential. Adam, as if you've been on this AMG journey, what have been the most defining moments for you? There's been a few. Um, I, think, I don't know if it's a, a moment, but I would just say that at the end of the day, any successful business is about its people. And, you know, we have a really exceptional team that we've been able to put in place. You know, my senior leadership team has worked with me in a variety of capacities, some of them for as long as 15 years. Um, so I've been very lucky. You know, I really view them as a family, as part of my family. And um, they're really just exceptional individuals, both personally and professionally. Um, beyond that, you know, for, in terms of like the sort of key moments as we've grown the business, I mentioned before the subscription line business moving over was a, was a critical moment for us in sort of rounding out our product set um, and being able to meet the needs of our clients at any phase of their life cycle. Um, also building out this distribution capability, right? Merchandising risk that we take on balance sheet is really important. And I really see us continuing to evolve in that regard as we'll make larger and larger commitments over time and look to bring in partners to work alongside us to, to provide best-in-class solutions for our, uh, for our clients. When we spoke before, you used the term streamlined, thoughtful, scalable. What mm -hmm. does that mean in terms of your business? You know, I think lending, unlike other parts of the market's business, um, you know, we're tr the trading businesses are going to be more opportunistic, right? They're going to be a function of what's happening in the broader market environment. Maybe it's 
the impact of what's happening in the macro environment, geopolitical, what could be happening in sort of credit um, and, and sort of the factors that influence risk in, in those parts of, of the market. With financing, the key to me has always been we have to be consistent. We have to be reliable. The user experience has to be great. So the more streamlined we are, if clients feel like they have a single touch point that they can use as a portal into Goldman Sachs, and there's consistency in terms of how we respond, and we're reliable at all parts of the market cycle, ultimately, we're going to grow with them. And so when we take a step back and we think about the growth of vaults and what's likely to happen, we're trying to play the long game. And so it's not about the trade. It's about the business. and It's about the relationship. And that's where we're investing our time. And to, to me, that's probably been one of the greatest successes of what we've accomplished over the last few years, which is to alter the view of sort of our reputation as a lender and really be there for our clients in both good and bad times. And what is your overall market outlook for fund finance in 2024? Um, a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, you know, in, in one sense, I feel you know, great about the growth of the market and the need for our products. Um, so there'll be plenty of opportunities. Um, when I look at the quantum of opportunities we saw last year, it's well north of 100 billion. Um, I expect that that number will only grow. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're gonna stay very disciplined and be thoughtful about what's lying below the surface, right? The fundamentals have to be there, right? Clearly, asset spreads have come in just at the start of the year. Maybe it's a January effect. Maybe it's, you know, people are flush with cash or outside the scope of the regulatory environment. They passed CCAR last year. Um, the non-banks are getting more and more aggressive. They're continuing to raise capital in the space. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks who are chasing opportunities and it's still pretty attractive. At the same time, they're going to need lenders to be um, you know, flexible. They're going to want us to be leaning in on price and structure to make the math work. There is a breaking point though, right? And so you always have to strike the right balance between being consistent, being aggressive, but also being disciplined. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of our North Star and making sure that we are, you know, continuing to grow the business at a proper pace, but not getting so far over our skis that we're just, we sort of lose our way and start doing things that are out of character for the way we run the business historically. What are your concerns for the fund finance market in 2024? It's a good question. Um, you know, listen, I think, we just were just at that conference in Miami we were talking about. And, you know, when you have that many people attending a conference and that much focus, um, you know, there is a risk that people get ultra aggressive. And over time, you see a degradation of terms and a lack of discipline. And so, you know, my concern would just be that we have to, at least at Goldman, we need to maintain our discipline in terms of what we're doing, who we're lending to, and how we're lending, and not have that deal fever where we're, we're, we're getting overextended or being over aggressive or chasing transactions that don't really fit our core in terms of how we traditionally have approached the business. Um, you know, this is an exciting market. So you, you tend to want to do everything that comes across your plate. But at the same time, there's real differentiation in the quality of deals that you see. Um, and so you just need to, to be really thoughtful about that. I will say that in, in various parts of the market, like PENF, um, specifically, I've seen a real deterioration there, both in terms of pricing and in terms of, you know, the collateral package and what people are willing to do from a, you know, from a pure uh, discipline perspective. So uh, that, that's a real concern for me. I want to make sure that we stay on the right side of that. And then hopefully the market, as we get into the year, will sort of find its equilibrium and, you know, we'll, there'll be a better balance between, you know, borrowers and lenders. You, you know, from where I sit, I'm seeing that as well, because we, we cover a broad swath of the market. And yeah. we even have clients that have said that they would like to see a default <laughs> to remind everyone that fundamentals are still really important. Absolutely. And there are lenders that I think are seeking to, or not that they would necessarily be seeking to, but they distinguish themselves by the fact that they really dig into the structure dig into the fund documents and want to have a fundal, fundamental understanding of who they're banking and, and, mm -hmm. and what, the, what the structure looks like and what the risk is and what the opportunity is? Alice, I think you can make the case that there are times where the tail wags the dog, right? Where, you know, as a lender, you sort of get comfortable with the fact that you're really taking high quality investment grade risk. And so you're somewhat insulated from any real exposure. 
And so it just becomes more of a technical market. You know, a common refrain is, well, look what's happening in private credit CLOs. Look how much spreads have compressed there. Well, then financing spread should follow suit. Well, that doesn't mean that the, the CLO market has things priced accurately. I mean, you've seen just in the past few weeks, BSL spreads came in dramatically. Private credit also collapsed. You're seeing direct originations happening now in the high fours, low fives. To make the to make the math work, financing spreads typically will have to come in dramatically as well. So as a lender, if you're feeling less comfortable with the un underlying fundamentals, but you feel insulated from the risk, how are you supposed to price that? How do you think about pricing? Are you supposed to proxy price it off of you know, more visible uh, assets in the market? Are you supposed to price it based on the cost of balance sheet? Or are you supposed to price it based on the deteriorating fundamentals and actually be backing spreads up? So we're trying to triangulate all of those things as we think about where the market needs to go. But again, it always comes back down to, you know, the level of partnership you have with your clients, the level of discipline you have in place, and the infrastructure that you build to make sure that you're surveilling the underlying assets and are comfortable with the risk you're taking. Are there any specific opportunities that you're really excited about in the next year? Yeah, I think this is um, this is going to be a really interesting time for the business, right? The um, the product sets continue to expand. I mean, I just look at like the CLO market as an example. Um, you know, you, there's going to be more securitization. There's going to be more product merchandising that happens because you have to bring in non-bank balance sheets into the equation in a capital efficient way. And so, I expect that part of the market will take off and grow. Um, I want to see us start leading more large size deals, and we want to commit more and more capital in one transaction. And we have the ability to syndicate. So if you're listening out there and you're thinking about you know, a massive facility that you're looking to do, please call us. Um, but you know, beyond that, you know, we, we also feel like there's going to be a lot of opportunity both in Europe and Asia. And um, you know, we, a lot of the decision making obviously has been centralized here in the US for some of the big global players. But we really feel like there is a real opportunity set. We have a great team in London that we're going to try to, you know, continue to enhance. And we think that um, if we focus there, we can continue to scale the business in very much the same way we've done here in the U.S. Adam, thank you so much for all of your insights That's and for great. taking the time to speak with us. I really appreciate it. This is Adam Zakow, Goldman Sachs, head of the Alternative Markets Group. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. Great.